Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I've referred to my notes for a little bit, and then I've got a presentation. Uh, but I, I suspect, um, to some degree, I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, it's not going to be, I doubt if anybody's going to, you know, stand up with pitchforks if we start talking about design thinking and design today. Uh, so it presents a little bit of a challenge because uh, there's no, I, I'm, everybody, all you have been converted. Uh, so I don't need to preach about it or evangelize it. So I'd like to just hopefully over the next 30 or 40 minutes maybe present some concepts or some provocations to you that you hadn't quite considered that help you when you take this, when you leave here and you go back to your day jobs that may help you to either practice a little better or help you in your own evangelism and in your own efforts to, to spread this, what we all, I think, in this room think is a necessary new way to work and a necessary change that we have to bring to our cultures to meet the threats of the 21st century. Um, yeah, just I want to start before I kind of get into the pitch, you know, this is kind of abstract. Design thinking is actually about thinking. Uh, it, it's about thinking how to think. And how do, we, how do we establish a way to continually understand and cope with the threats that we face? And I think that this is kind of a fundamental difference as we, as we move from what I'll call a complicated century in the 20th century, uh, we've moved into a complex world. We moved into a complex world where the threats that are emergent are unknown and by and large unknowable very far in advance. And we can worry about time frames. Am I talking a month? Am I talking a year? Am I talking three years? But that's not very long, especially when we're confronted with the potential scale of these threats. And so I think the single biggest thing that we're talking about when we talk about design thinking, when we talk about bringing design into military applications, what we're really talking about is changing from a mental model that deals with threats to a mental model that deals with primarily being ready to understand what those threats might be. It's a subtle shift. It's one that we've made inside of IBM. Five years ago, when we started our design program, we realized that we were constantly reacting to what was in the world. We hadn't developed a capa an institutional capability, and you can call it whatever you want. You can call it an institutional capability towards curiosity, an institutional capability of marrying a bias toward action with that curiosity. That's not what we had worked on. What we had worked on was building a culture that was able to deal with identified threats. We hadn't built a culture that was primarily about identifying threats. That's the shift that we've gone under. And when you don't have that ability to identify the threats in front of you, uh, you're always going to be behind, you're going to be behind the curve. And as the capability of delivering a threat, whether it's in a commercial or military context, when the capability to deliver that threat is moving at the pace that the world moves today, you're really in trouble if you aren't out in front of the identification. And that's really what we're talking about. It's, to me, it's, it's, it's that simple, uh, is how do, we, how do we establish that? The other thing that I just kind of want to put out there as a, as a high-level concept, and we'll hopefully come back to it over the course of my presentation, is how do we do this in military or defense organizations? Uh, because there's a couple of fundamental differences, you may think, between one of those organizations and my organization. Uh, first of all, you're a monopoly in your country. I'm not. Does that present a difference? Does that mean, does that mean it's harder to, to do something? And if you're a mon monopoly and you don't have this competitive threat, 
how do these practices that we've developed at IBM, for example, how do they apply? And I would argue two things. First of all, you have to do something because you're a monopoly. Uh, by definition, uh, monopolies become homogenous. And by definition, the ideation in a self-perceived monopoly begins to stagnate over time. We have to intentionally insert some provocation into those cultures that help keep them vibrant. And I think that design and design thinking is the most potent lever that we can insert into a culture to help keep it vibrant. And the second thing I would say, and maybe this, I don't know if this is, is or isn't interesting, but from my standpoint, I think you do have competitors. One of the things that I hope you'll get when, we, when I get into the slides is a view of what we are designing is actually has nothing to do whatsoever with any product. If what we are actually trying to design is a response to a threat that we have un understood, if that is the question, then we have competitors all around the world. And that can be used, and as we turn this method into thinking about the competitive landscape in the context of the people we are in engaging with, uh, I think there's some interesting things that can come of it. So, idea number one. Human-centered design is not about product. It's actually about irrationality. Now, why do I say that? Human-centered design is not about product. Human-centered design is about rationality. Nathan Shedroff, who ran the executive program at the, Cal College Cal uh, the California College of Arts, says being a designer is about making choices to trigger the right response. Think about that. That's the single most interesting definition of design I've ever read. I have it written in my office. Being a designer is about making choices that trigger the right response. And when you couple that, at IBM, we're a business-to-business -business company. We build software that our people don't use. We build software for oncologists. We build software for telco network supervisors. We build software for all sorts of people who we are not. And by and large, the people in this room are not the users either. And I'm going to twist this word users on its end throughout the presentation today. A lot of the presentation is going to talk about users, but it's important that you understand what I mean when I'm talking about users. When I talk about triggering the right response on the part of a user, and we are not our user, you can imagine in any setting a product development team realizing that they don't have any people with sight disabilities on the team. And so in order to bring that understanding into the development process of a, of a product or of some service, right? It may, be the, it may be the line at a McDonald's, or it may, may be how we, how we build a product where we know or where the possibility of having people with sight disabilities using it is there. We can actually manufacture empathy. This is actually some of our designers and engineers using low vision goggles to simulate uh, site issues and reviewing their screen designs as a result. It's people with disabilities. They're part of this user population. But here's an interesting case also where the users in this case are actually people that have been affected by a disaster. How do we respond to them? How do we understand them? We are not them. We still have our homes, potentially. Masses of people 
shopping? How do we understand them? How do we understand their motivations? How do we deal with them? How do we get them through the store? How do we make sure their experience is better? Or potentially something very, very different. If we are trying to change the hearts and minds of a population, if we're trying to deal with something that, for example, it ended up in the surge in Afghanistan and Iraq, these are our users. And these are the people that we have to understand. These are the people whose empathy we have to bring into our own organizations because if we don't understand these people, we will not impact them. We will not be able to trigger the right response. And this is what I talk about when I talk about kind of thinking about the competitive landscape. If these are our users, if these are the people in whom we want to trigger the right response, you absolutely have competitors out there just as much as I do in a product space. And your competitors are trying to understand these people also and are trying to trigger very different responses. And at the end of the day, that's what design and design thinking brings to our organizations, are these powerful concepts that we are not our users. And these questions, who is it that we're trying to impact and what do we want them to do? That's it. And it can be applied to every problem we face in the world. And that's why this is so powerful. Who are we trying to serve and what do we want them to do? It may result in a digital application. It may result in a service. It may result in, you know, blasting leaflets from a from a bomber. It may result in any number of potential ways to, a, to deal with this, but this is the fundamental question that design thinking, or questions that design thinking is built to answer. We don't do it all the time. Julio Otino is the dean of the engineering school at Northwestern University, and he says the biggest risk to not that you'll fa uh, fail to solve the problem in front of you it's that you'll solve the wrong problem perfectly. Now we know what that means. Ready, fire, aim. We see it all the time. We don't stop to actually consider what the real problem is, who the real users are, what their motivations are, what are the irrationalities, so-called, that they're bringing to the conversation that we are then exponentially kind of ignoring, because we're bringing our own irrationalities in the form of bias and projection to the problem. All right, so let me, let me kind of pivot here, and I'm going to introduce a, a framework to you that we're going to use kind of throughout the middle part of this talk, and kind of talk to you about the, the process of how this works. And I've got an example of us building a digital application, but you'll kind of get, for those of you who I thought it would be interesting to just kind of get practical and talk a little bit about how we practice design thinking at IBM, uh, how the process works, and uh, then maybe certainly interject in real time or as we get to Q&A if you have any specific comments or questions about points in the process or how some of what we do may apply in your situation, feel free to do that. It's a simple graphic. You can imagine that the x-axis is the time it takes to do something, to deliver an outcome, to deliver a service, to implement a program, uh, to, you know, to pivot and, and, and do something different in the field. Whatever the project is that you're doing, that x-axis is, how long does it take you to come to understand it, uh, to test it, and then to ship it? The y-axis is a little bit more interesting uh, right there in the center where, you, if you can see that really faint zero, that, that's, actually, that's actually the optimal outcome. And basically, if you deliver something out here that's above zero, you've spent too much. Zero hits the mark. Zero does the job. So if you go way above zero, you've spent too much. If you go below zero, you've delivered too little. And this is the goal of anything. When we 
kick off projects, uh, we, always, we always have project requirements, right? And theoretically, uh, it's not like anybody is intentionally, and, and you know, w w without, obviously, sometimes it happens, but I'm not getting into the kind of joke scenarios. But nobody really intentionally inflates requirements. Uh, and nobody intentionally leaves requirements off. And yet, empirical evidence shows that the vast majority of projects miss the mark of what they were intended to be. So that's interesting. So we always start over here, by and large, we think we start right here at zero. And somewhere out here, we get off that scale. That perfect project starts with a perfect set of product requirements and definition. And all along its development, some months later, years later, however, however long it takes to do that thing, some time later, we deliver it, and it's perfect, right? Doesn't happen very often. In fact, what typically happens is we start off with all these re requirements, and our, 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 our band of possible outcomes or probable outcomes is actually much, it, it kind of veers off of that zero line. It may, it may look like this if it's a pretty darn good set of requirements. It probably starts to look more like this where there's actually a pretty big margin for error because we can misinterpret those product requirements. We get into the real world of, the, uh, of delivering those requirements and we scrap some things off and we add some things later. You know, in, in, in my case, you know, uh, my, my chairman comes in and she she does something, and in your case, a general, you know, a four-star general walks in or whomever walks in, and we, we have a name for that at IBM. We call it the swoop and poop. <laughs> you know, some Bigfoot comes in from the top at the 11th hour and says, I just talked to so-and-so, blah. And I mean the hierarchical chain of command goes into effect, and the project team completely derails and goes way off the charts. Doesn't matter what was in that original project brief. So what really happens, if you think about most projects, you start with a detailed set of requirements, but the reality of the probability of outcomes is a very wide spectrum down the road. Initial conditions are everything. And so when the initial conditions are either too vague or way too specific, we've found that the probability of hitting an outcome is the distribution is exceedingly wide. And so what we want to do is we actually want to insert some, some way so that we can more probably deliver what triggers that right response in as quick a time possible. Operationally, that's what we're doing here today. Operationally, as we talk about design thinking, why are we doing this? It's not because we love design thinking. It's because we love doing the right thing. We love triggering the right response. And it helps us do that more effectively, faster than any other method I've ever seen in my professional career. And of course, in most cases, when we get all those project requirements, as we know, they're fighting the last battle. <coughs> they're, usually very, they're, they're, they're usually not very forward thinking. And so the reality is that even those initial requirements weren't on target. They were on yesterday's target. And so now we really have a skewed distribution of outcomes. So this is the world we're in. Real life solutions oftentimes miss the mark. Sometimes they miss the mark because they completely fail to satisfy the user. Sometimes they miss the mark because we've, we have to spend way too much money to deliver them. And so the question is, how do we how do we deal with this? So how do we ensure that we're solving the right problem? And how do we stay focused on the real human-based outcomes that we want throughout the life of the process? And that's where we started doing some interesting work around design thinking. Uh, and how do you scale it out? And how do you do this not one time, but how do you do this a thousand times, two thousand times? At IBM, when we started this in 2013, we had nobody that practiced design thinking. Uh, of our 
roughly speaking, 370,000 people. Uh, we had 75 designers, um, except for one team. Uh, every one of those designers were singletons brought in by acquisitions, and they reported to non-designers. It was a completely ineffectual, except for, except for a single team of about 15. It was a completely ineffectual capability. And so uh, fast forward to today. Uh, today we have about 2,000 formally trained designers at IBM of those 370,000. We have something in excess of 2,000 teams practicing design thinking in their daily work. And we have certified and badged through a digital credentialing system approaching 200,000 IBMers. And these badges at IBM are not given. Actually, that's not true. The, there is an initial badge that is given completely digitally. It's a, it's a kind of a traditional education program. But I think the interesting thing that we've introduced in our, the primary badging program is that it is experiential. We believe very much that design thinking can't be taught. It is, in fact, common sense. If you teach it, everybody will simply nod their head, and then they'll go back and keep doing the work that they were doing. They have to be, they have to use it in the context of some problem space. And so the vast majority of our design thinking credentialed people have gotten their credentials because they delivered something using this approach, and then they continue to do it. So as we think about project requirements, Think about this. Forget project requirements. We've got to somehow move beyond the project requirement as being the beginning of the process. Now, this is, this is potentially the single hardest thing that you all will face in government procurement, or primarily, I'm assuming, government procurement situations. Because all of our procurement policies are based on starting with a very detailed set of vetted requirements, and then you bring in your partners. This is the most fundamentally broken aspect of everything that we see in the world. And so I think if there's one thing that I would encourage you as a group of people to work, because it's not something that's going to be solved tomorrow. You can't walk out and just change these things. I think we, as a, as a, as a community, have got to start working to come up with an academically supported, a validated, a rigorous model for how we kick off projects in this world and how funding for those projects is established and maintained. Uh, I'm an ops guy. By that, that's really what I, more than anything else, I'm an ops guy. I get how to implement things. And I will tell you that this, this funding question is probably other, yes, the mindset, yes, getting people trained on this approach, getting people bought into this approach, applying this approach, yes, all those are things that have to happen. Those are non-trivial. How do you do it at scale? All that. It, from what I've seen in working in the defense sector, the single biggest obstacle that has yet to have a solution is this obstacle of how do we get projects funded and how do we maintain that funding when we know that starting the project with a rigorous set of detailed requirements and basing the funding on the completion of those requirements is the single most probable way we will deliver the wrong thing. So we have this saying, a real human is worth a thousand meetings. So I want to walk you through kind of, I want to walk you through an alternative way to think about the project from day one. Forget the requirements. Go back to that thing I said earlier. We are about how do we trigger the right response in the people that we're trying to impact. Whether those people are enemy combatants, whether those people are our war fighters, whether those people are logistics people with a new application in the supply chain. Who are the people that we are trying to impact? And you start there. I'm going to tell you the story of a product that we built. It's a fairly simplistic story, uh, but you'll, I think you'll pattern match to it. Uh, the, first, the first thing is uh, a lot of people start out with um, personas. You, you, all, you all have heard of personas? Everybody? Is there anybody who hasn't heard of a persona? Okay, good. Because nobody's raising their hand, I'm going to assume that you've all heard of personas. 
The problem with personas, by the way, is they are their own form of bias. As we put a persona on the wall, then we start talking about how they say, what they say, and what they do, and what they're thinking, and how they feel. We do understand that that's not a person. That's us projecting onto a person. That's good. That's a good start. We're at least kind of trying to get out of our own heads. But the reality is the process has to be baked into real users. These were real people that had a problem around a solution space that we were interested in attacking. We felt like there was some opportunities. We kind of, I, I kind of have this 90 degree thing of you start with a kind of a very high level, one or two sentence, you know, vision or idea of the 90 degree space that you want to go attack. I have a hypothesis that there's some interesting stuff we could do here. Now go find some real people in this space. These are those real people in this particular situation where we're going to be building a process mapping tool. HR manager, HR specialist, we felt like these were people that diagrammed uh, processes and workflows quite a bit. Uh, the business process management center of excellence, this is the subject matter expert uh, and another subject matter expert here. Real people, and we interviewed these people. We went out and we did field research. We have developed a, a capability inside of IBM that you will need to do if you practice this at scale of ethnography. And we're hiring not only trained design researchers, but anthropologists, all sorts of liberal arts majors, people who have the critical thinking skills and, and, and who can go out in the field and observe what's really happening, not just ask what's happening. This isn't about the, you know, oh, what do you want? I want a faster horse. This is looking at people and then pattern matching back to what the available technology is or solution space is and identifying that. Those real people and the interviews and the observations of those real people devolve into all sorts of patterns and from those patterns is where the personas come in. A lot of people get this backwards. They start with a persona, then they go try to find real people. It's the other way around. You start with real people, you assimilate all the information, and you end up with these personas. So this is the first thing that we've done, is a project doesn't start with product requirements. It starts with validated user needs. This is the single most interesting starting point for projects, is validated user needs. It's the new starting point for projects in this world. And so you can see that we've moved now. We now have a pretty good idea. It's not right on zero. We haven't exhausted the universe of users. But we feel like we've got a, a pretty good enough sample of real people in the real world that have validated this need, that have helped us understood the triggers that are required to get them to change their behaviors. And so now we've started pretty much on zero. We feel better about the starting point. We then start doing work around the, 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 these personas. This person right here is we bring them into environments. This is a whole collection of people of both real people and real users as well as engineers. And in fact, in this phase of the process, uh, the people in purple on the left would be the people on your team. And by and large, the people in teal on the right, by and large, those are people that aren't on your team. Those are people out in the world. Those are the people you're trying to impact. And you'll see something interesting here. In this early phase of ideation and what have you, it's more than 50% of the people that are involved in this are not on your team. This is what we've found leads to the best results. This is before we've started solutioning at all. This is how we move from ready, fire, aim to ready, aim, fire. Engaging our stakeholders at the beginning instead of the end allowed for us to get the true pain points. You could feel the emotion from these users coming off of the comments and quotes. It was really powerful. We moved from project requirements to statements of intent. Now, the interesting thing about our particular approach is we have a thing called hills. And these statements of intent, once we now have done the user research, we've got the, we're directionally feeling pretty good about where we're starting from. And then we really start honing in on the problems and the pains 
And we start, we start to begin to see the movement that we want to make in the world. We're not talking about the implemented solution. I'm talking about we now understand to a pretty big degree what triggers have to be pulled and what outcomes we want those users or that population of people to move toward. Interestingly enough, this is all based on commander's intent. How do you align big teams of people who are going to be have to making micro decisions in the field in real time, how do you align them around a mission? The military does this. We built our Hills concepts around the concepts of commander's intent to align those teams. Now a Hill for us, we've commercialized it a little bit, and so a Hill for us has three components, a who, a what, and a wow. And across these 2,000 pro uh, project teams at IBM today, you will see them all talking about hill statements. And when they talk about a hill statement, they're talking about something like, in our case, a data center operator can recover from a complete disaster at a data center within six hours with zero data loss. There's not a single implementation statement in there. We don't say whether, whether we're going to do it through a manual. We don't say whether it's going to be push a button. We don't say whether it's going to be put 50 buttons. But that's going to be the outcome. The change in behavior is that within six hours, you're going to be fine, even if you're, a tornado tears down your data center. And the trigger, therefore, is the solution that we put in place to do that. It's a who, a what, and a wow. I'll give you a story, just real quick, funny story. We got a call, uh, about half of our designers work on internal IBM products and about a half of our designers work with clients uh, to help, help understand their problems and solve them better. We got a call from an airline in Australia and they said, we need a new kiosk. Will you design us a new kiosk in our air for airports? Sure. Why? Because our gate attendants are not using them. So if something is wrong, we want, it, we want you to come in and design a new kiosk. So okay, that's a, that's a good project, right? Uh, sounds reasonable. They're not using it. We need a new one. The first thing we did, and we could have done that. We could have gone off. Our industrial designers could have had a heyday. We could have built a beautiful new kiosk. The interesting thing is we went into the airport and we just observed. Uh, I don't have the picture. I was trying to find it last night, uh, but I couldn't find it. But we had, there's a great picture of one of our user researchers, and she is just standing in the background, way in the back. There's a crazy gate stuff, and she's standing there. We have a photo of her doing this, and there's people all around. Anyway, she gets there, and she watches for two or three days. And here's what she finds. That wall socket is really low to the floor. The gate attendants, it turns out, were required by their uniforms to wear short pencil skirts. And the gate attendants were embarrassed to plug in the kiosk. They were rolling kiosks, and if they rolled it to the gate, they would have to bend down and plug it in. And they didn't do it. It's nothing to do with the kiosk. It had everything to do with the location of the electrical out. That's what happens when you stop thinking in this world of these are the project requirements and into the world of, wait a minute, these are the humans that are not doing something that I want them to do. Why? And how do I get them to do it? This is a really hard, it's easy, concept, like in this room, it's really hard to get that mindset. It really, truly instantiated. It's about changing the behavior of a human, hopefully for the better. And it doesn't matter whether you're hacking Facebook. In that case, you're trying to change the behavior of the human to your end. Make no mistake, that was a designed project. You can do the same for good as well.
These were two user statements that we got in a different project, and I just want to kind of give you a sense of how these hills evolve. It's these hills evolve based on all of that user input. Here was one, unfortunately, redundant work occurs within a single institution. These were researchers, uh, uh, metal science researchers, uh, and he's telling us that redundant works because we're siloed everywhere. This other user said uh, that he got frustrated when he spent hours going down a rabbit hole and it didn't result in anything. So we built a hill around this and much more research for this particular project. And I just wanted to do this just to give you a sense of, of how these hills are phrased. Introduce a new search paradigm while leveraging familiar interaction patterns so that researchers can integrate new concept-based results into their current workflows. This might sound like somewhat gobbledygook, or it may seem obvious, but there's actually a lot of very interesting things that if you align a team around this and they truly understand this hill, there's a lot of very interesting things that come about out of it. Familiar interaction pattern for the search paradigm, it means I gotta be able to do it without any training. Researchers, that's my target user, and they can integrate these things into existing workflows. We have to make sure that these things break down the silos of those organizations. So we do that by ideating, ideating, ideating. We continue ideating, and you'll see the, the fidelity of these various explorations get higher and higher as we start thinking about actual solutions now that, that meet the hill. We have this notion that nothing is precious. Everything is a prototype. And all along this journey, we're getting closer and closer to our goal. Higher fidelity. You can't imagine the number of iterations. This is a process. This is not intuition. We get feedback early and often. We stay aligned by making sure everybody's informed. Every one of those dots in this, in this kind of abstract chart is what we call a playback. This is not a scrum. This is a broader set of stakeholders where we're bringing people in to constantly validate the work. And as we do this, we're narrowing the range of possible outcomes that the teams are working on. And we do it more and more. And finally, we start to get to something that is relatively looking high fidelity. We may find a problem, we throw it away, we come back to low-level resolution and what have you. All of this is to say it's not about outcomes. I mean, it's not about design. Design is just a way to get to what we want. What we want is the right outcome. We want these users to do something different tomorrow that they didn't do today. That's the point of all of this. Getting to the final, in this case, high-resolution digital screen, screens and we took the hill. When teams are aligned like this, speed happens fast. This process that I've just walked you through, if you saw the chart, it talked about months. The fact was we conceived of, we did the research for, we validated, and we delivered a product to market, in this case, in six weeks. And this was a team of about 50 or 60 people at IBM. This had never been done before in this kind of time frame. This was using our version of design thinking. We call it enterprise design thinking. It's built around these concepts of hills and playbacks and sponsor users. It is built with this notion of we live in a continuous delivery world. Uh, the, the, we call it the loop, and the loop is actually what's central to it. We are always in the loop. And it's based on a set of foundational principles that are important to us. It's focused on these users. It's focused on the changed behavior of the people that we are serving. That's what this is all about. This notion of constant delivery, restless reinvention, and finally, built on diverse, empowered teams. Design thinking, the one last kind of big concept I'll leave you with, because I also see that this is more pronounced. It's pronounced in big organizations like IBM, but it's even more pronounced in uh, government settings and, uh, and university settings. And it's this notion of functional silos. Design thinking is uh, probably the single most powerful approach to breaking down those, breaking down those silos. 
As the New York Times said, or somebody was quoted as saying about our program in the New York Times, it used to be we changed what we were working on. It used to be we reacted to the threat that was presented. But today what we're doing is changing how we work. It's based on people and places and practices. We've changed the way we kick off projects. Human-centered design is not the product. It's about the irrationality of the human being that you're trying to serve or the population you're trying to move to some different point of view and to take action based on that movement. Who are we trying to impact? What do we want them to do? That's what this is all about. Thank you very much. So I think we've got 10 or 12 minutes, something like that, for, uh, for, for Q&A. And I don't know how we're going to do this. I'll, I'll go to the, I know we've got some that you've, got, you've been posting them up here. I'll do this first. And you all can get your raising your hand jitters out. And we can go live in a minute. Is design as much about a mindset as, as it is about a set of methods and techniques? And if so, what are the characteristics of that mindset? Um, I, I think it is. And I think, you know, I think the characteristics of that mindset there are obvious ones of you know, curiosity, open-mindedness, but I think, I think fundamentally the designer's mindset is one that uh, is trying to deal with the, uh, is, is, is constantly evaluating who are the users that I'm trying to serve and, 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 and where, do I, where do I want, you know, what, what better place do I want to take them to? And then what are my goals in doing that? I've got to keep that. That's a constraint out there too. I have goals. At IBM, we want to sell things. We're in business. We're a for-profit company. That's okay. We have that goal. We can still, you know, you can imagine a Venn diagram. And then the third thing that I think the designer uniquely keeps in their head is the societal impact. And I think where, you know, Charles Eames said, where those three things come together, that's the space for the designer. Where the user need, the, the uh, you know, protagonist need, if you will, and society, where those interests align, that's the space for the, the, the designer. Where you're missing that, you know, uh, Jack Welch used to talk about hiring people, and he said that, you know, when you hire people, you look for uh, uh, passion, uh, intellect, and integrity. And if you are missing any one of those three, you're in real trouble. And he gives highlights of people who had two of the three, and, and you kind of get these skewed people. I think when you're, you know, when you're trying to do the right thing, uh, when you keep those three things in your mind, who am I trying to serve, what are my organization's interests and goals, and what are society's interests and goals, I think that's a good, I think that's a great framework, and I think it's a unique framework that only the designer brings to a problem space. Yeah, by the way, any live things, just holler. I can't because of the lighting, I can't see too much. So you really got to raise your hand and jump around. Missing a, part, uh, missing a part of reflecting when we purposely or unpurposely pose a threat to others. Missing a part of reflecting when we purposely or unpurposely pose a threat to others. Are we the only good doers? That might cause bias as well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, there are... Um, and, and it's why this, I didn't go into the details behind it, but it's why it's this notion of diversity is so important. Uh, and it's, we've really baked it into, you'll, you'll notice it was one of the principles of our whole program was diverse empowered teams. If you look at, for example, agile methodologies and the agile manifesto, it's about empowered teams. Uh, we intentionally added that, that word diverse, and we talk about diversity in all of its forms, a diversity of skill sets, uh, diversity of perspectives, and we bring that in through all sorts of, you know, ways of inclusion, uh, whether in, it, it could be gender or racial, um, it could be sexual identification and preference, it could be cultural, 
you know, we like to make products and we intentionally uh, prefer to make products on multiple continents because that teaming brings in different perspectives. So uh, I, I, I think the way that you help ensure uh, this notion of um, uh, making sure that you don't project a bias that exists on the team uh, is, is really helped by making sure that there is a di diverse team. It's why, this, it's why the silo conversation is so important. It's very important that when you do things, you, do, you, you, you intentionally try to build teams that are across silos. It's why playbacks are not scrums. Scrums are the execution team. Oftentimes we see execution teams are in fact within one organization. They're leading the charge of actually developing the thing. These playbacks are intentionally broader than that and that's where you bring in a, the, the broadest set of stakeholders around a particular program or solution or whatever uh, possible. Um, the notion of good is interesting, um, and it's probably a good philosophical question as to, um, you know, the, uh, you know, just to pick a topical thing, was the was the was the Russian hack of Facebook that impacted the U.S. election good or bad? I'm guessing it's where you sit, you know. I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to be flippant. Somebody designed that, and it absolutely in my opinion, advanced the, it advanced the, uh, the agenda of whoever was doing it, right? Um, and that, like, a, that's a fact. It was a design thing. It was a design thing. Somebody was very intentional, and they understood the users, and the users moved to different places. They triggered, they triggered the response they wanted, uh, allegedly. And uh, was that the right response? Uh, I don't think so, but it happened. As we move into the age of AI, uh, this issue of, I think, societal, there's two big trends right now in design uh, or in, in the world that I think are, are interesting and have the potential for great abuse. One is AI itself. We all know the, you know, the, the, everybody's read all that. Uh, the other one is this notion of computational design. I don't know if any of you have read about, uh, there's kind of this, this theory of the classical designer, the contemporary designer, then the, the, the uh, computational designer is this new designer. I don't, uh, I'm a little worried about that concept out there. Uh, the computational designer is essentially uh, saying that we don't, saying I'm, I'm glossing over it a little bit, but basically our empathy is going to come from data, behavioral data. So all of this data that's being collected, the computational designer is going to be using all of this behavioral data to understand how to, how to, how to trigger the responses that they want. And I believe that it's... Uh, and especially as we're learning more and more about where this data is ending up, I believe that this notion of the societal impact, uh, you know, is, is really fundamental to the design profession today and to how far do we get away from interacting with real human beings even if we theoretically have all of the data. The data itself is A, potentially biased, and B, has potentially been collected without the consent of the human. And I think that presents a pretty serious ethical issue. Certainly, any, it's as ethical as any of the AI issues I've seen. So I think th those are two areas where the design profession is uh, going to be grappling with it over the next decade or so. Bill? Yeah. Um, I'm going to argue instead of question. Okay. okay. Awesome. Uh, has to do with the opening of your uh, talk. Great. Uh, I come from the Israel Defense Forces. Uh, militaries are not monopolies anymore, even in their own field. Mm. Uh, you have the other defense organizations in the same country. Interesting. Uh, an example of that is the opening operation in Afghanistan post-September 11th. Yep. Where the military did not come 
with a good product, and the CIA and the special community just snatched the operation from them. Ah. Okay? So they have their own competition. They still think themselves as monopolies. Interesting. They still think of themselves as monopolies, but it's not true anymore. Okay? Even within the military, if an Air Force or the special community or the intelligence community, they have competition between themselves of what the right, right. operation is going to become. And, and, but I agree with you that the competition needs to happen. And if it's not there, you have to invent one. Yes. My second argument, they all pertain to each other. Yeah. The second argument <laughs> is that we're also our own users to begin with. I mean, when we design the strategy and operation, 75% of this new product is going to affect us. Yes. Because we have to change the way we think, we have to change how we are organized, as you say, even break the silos, and we have to invent new force buildup. So if the product, we're the, we're the users first, and then it's going to be our rivals and the populations that we operate within. And the final one, the fundamental problem that you talked about, how to fund projects, where the trigger question is different to begin with, mm -hmm. you have to work with the generals. Yep. If All you right. only teach design to the people at the hierarchy, you are not going to change the trigger point and the fundamental problem. Yeah. So a couple of things on that. The, we are not our users. <clears throat> um, great points. And, and the, the competition one is, I, I was thinking, as I, as I thought about that provocation uh, last night, the other one is obviously, I don't know what it's like in your all's countries, but in the U.S. there are these, uh, you know, uh, for hire private contractors right. that we hired to go over there. So I take your point on that. On the we're not our users, I, I, let, me, let me drill down on that a little bit, because I'm, I'm gonna push back a little bit on that. When I say we are not our users, I'm talking about the people who are actually building the thing. They may have used to been that user, <laughs> but in their day job today, they're probably not that user. And I'll give you a, the, the we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of, uh, let's take a person who was a, uh, a data scientist at J.P. Morgan Bank that we hire into IBM and we put them on a product team to build tools for data scientists at J.P. Morgan Bank. We find that we have a real issue in that person retaining their bias because they think they know that user when in fact the person out in the real world that's still doing that job is seeing new things. And this person is remembering the past. So unlike when Steve Jobs built the iPhone, he was going to use the iPhone. Like, he was literally going to use the iPhone. Uh, so when I talk about us not being our users in a B2B or in this context, it's that in the moment, the day job of the person will probably not be using the tooling. That's not 100% true, but it's true in most cases. And then as you start moving into things that I think are even more interesting than the building of particular uh, you know, weapons or particular internal processes, as we start thinking about applying design thinking to, for example, the situation that existed in Afghanistan before the surge, uh, I have become uh, friends with Stan McChrystal. He came to the team of teams. I'm sure you all have read Team of Teams. And you know that concept. It was very interesting as I was reading that book. Uh, the answer that he got to, I called design thinking. He called it Team of Teams. But radical collaboration, radical transparency, all these things. And uh, applying it to those kinds of problems, I think, is even more powerful than applying it to the traditional procurement processes. Um, so that's definitely a place where we're not those, we're not those people, right? And I think the third point you had was... The generals. The oh, yeah. So ju just so you know, so totally true. Um, we, uh, when we started our program, uh, uh, I'll get a little bit tactical, and, then, and we've got 16, actually, I'm 16 seconds over, so this, uh, this will be the last one. We got very tactical, uh, but uh, you're exactly right. We, st we, we, we started training all of the teams at the bottom, all the teams that were doing things. We trained in this approach. And I had established a comms channel, essentially with the generals, in my case, senior vice presidents and CEO. Uh, and we kind of intentionally, at the beginning, we were just going to squeeze out all those middle line people. That didn't work. And so we actually developed a very short course. And so from that point forward, when we brought a team into our program, 
we called it the Hallmark Program. When a team came into the Hallmark Program to come into this world, they made a couple of commitments. One commitment was they were going to abide by my rules, okay? But the second commitment was on the part of all of their line management up to our chairman. They would come to this class within 90 days. That was a huge accelerant to the success of our program. So we, we developed that course. It is available if you're interested in talking to us. We've got some IBMers here. I'm not here to, this isn't a sales pitch, but uh, we, that was really fundamental. And it was interesting because in that course, we tell these people, we know you got day jobs. You're not going to become design thinkers tomorrow. That's, the intention of that course is not to turn them into design thinkers. The intention of that course is to educate them on what their teams are doing and why it's important and to educate them on the vocabulary that if they use with their team, it'll reinforce to the team that they're on the right track. So really good observation. Thank you. I'm going to go think about this competition. Uh, and I'd like to, I, unfortunately, I have to get back to London. But I would love to kind of continue that conversation about how you all think about your, your competitors, whether it's Army versus CIA or Army versus Blackwater. Uh, that, that would be interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks very much. <laughs>